Anybody there? Hey, it's Hank Linderman. How are you all doing? I'm not sure why my microphone didn't work, and so I hope you can hear me. Uh, it's good to see you all. Uh, once again, technological difficulties. Boy, I'm just wrestling with this kind of endlessly. Uh, Mark Andes is here. Mark, do me a favor, share this thing. Uh, Roy, you too, man. Share this thing for me. Uh, once again, the technological difficulties are... I've been up for hours and hours. Larry Schatz here, Mark Maselli's here, Bo Fox, Mark Andes, everybody share this video. Bill McNichol is here. Before, Bill, I've been asking him. I've been asking him, Bill. I've been doing my job. Uh, anyway, I hope you all will do me a favor and share the video. There's so much to talk to you about and uh, almost too much. I mean, I've got my... Look how thick this thing of paper is that is my preparation. I had so many nice things things to show you. And the first one uh, that I'm not able to show you was a very funny thing of um, uh, a picture of uh, Sasha Byron Cohen, who uh, you all probably know as Borat and various other things. Uh, he apparently appeared at a right-wing rally recently, fairly recently, and got them to sing kind of terrible songs. He got them to sing along with it. Well, he is in the New York Post today, I believe. He apparently pranked uh, Rudy Giuliani. He somehow tricked Rudy Giuliani into agreeing to an interview and Sasha apparently had everything set up. Oh, let's see, what's Bo saying? Oh, that's Billy. Okay, Susan Fox is here. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Roy. Everybody, remember to share. If you haven't already done it, please do it. Anyway, Sasha Baron Cohen arranged for an interview with Rudy Giuliani and Rudy was waiting and uh, I guess Sasha came in in a pink bikini. And uh, I gotta give it to Rudy Giuliani. Uh, he actually had kind of a sense of humor about it. He didn't recognize Sasha Baron Cohen at first, but he got the heck out. And uh, But later on, when he realized it was Sasha Baron Cohen, he said, well, actually, I'm a fan. I, I loved Borat. And he repeated one of Borat's funny lines uh, in his accent. Well, anyway, if you haven't been here before, Joanne is here. Joanne, I'm so glad you're here. Do me a favor, please and share this on your Facebook page. Uh, we're trying to get our numbers keep going. We've had over a thousand views every day this week and it's just incredible. That's really, really wonderful. So uh, we've got so much to talk about. I'm your Democratic nominee for Congress here in Kentucky's second district. 21 counties, Davis, Harden, Warren, Bullitt, Nelson, Barron, Boyle, Mead, Mercer, Brickenridge, Grayson, Hart, Hancock, LaRue, Washington, Garrett, Jessamine, Green, Edmondson, Butler, Spencer. Hi, Beth, I'm glad you're here. Everybody share. Nelson is here. I don't recognize your name, Nelson. You must be new around here. I'm glad to have you. Uh, we ask you a favor if you'll please share this so that your friends get to see it too. Nancy, uh, I'm glad you're here. Well, let, let's start talking about what uh, what I was going to talk to you about. Um, let's see. And I don't have any pretty pictures to show you, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Mark. You're you're hooking us up. Mary Anderson is here. Hi, Mary. How are you? Bill, Bill uh, McNichol, our social media guy, is going to be on you in a moment to share. And it's just better if you say, I already did. So I already did. Anyway, I'm looking at worldometers or worldometers.info for information from yesterday, July 8th. And we had a terrible day of new cases 61,848 new cases. Hi, Mary. Glad you're here. Uh, that's. You know, a few, I guess last week, Dr. Fauci said something about, you know, we may wind up with 100,000 cases, new cases a day. And I thought, boy, that doesn't seem right. We were at 25,000 cases a day. Now, 61,848, it doesn't look that crazy. And we had 890 deaths. And if you've got, you've got a family member or a friend who passed away, of course, it's a tragedy. And I'm going to look at what's going on in the States in uh, we've been having a bit of a race going back and forth between Texas and Florida. Well, Texas has a narrow lead. They've got 10,199 new cases and Florida's got 9,989. So that's probably within the margin of error, which is really sad. Dennis is here. Dennis, I don't recognize you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, it's always great to have new folks here. And if you want to comment and ask a question, go for it. And uh, Depending on my uh, ability, I'll do my best, okay? Anyway, folks, it's really getting worse and worse. We're going to talk more and more about that. 
Um, but the first story I want to talk to you all about is uh, from a website called the, New, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And the headline says, Ryan Jenkins is here. Ryan, do I know you? Your name seems familiar to me. Anyway, Ryan, we're glad you're here. Please comment or have a question, or, uh, but first, please share the broadcast. Anyway, we're looking at a headline that says, Big Pharma wants to pocket the profits from a COVID treatment you already paid for, you meaning us, the government. And the company that markets Remdesivir, if I'm pronouncing that right, if we have any doctors, you can tell me if I've got this right, or pharmacists listening. Remdesivir, Remdesivir, sounds good to me. All right, uh, we're trying to figure out what a fair price for Gilead's, Gilead's the name of the company, what should we charge for a treatment for COVID-19? And they set their wholesale acquisition price at $390 a vial for governments of developed companies, countries, which means approximately 2,340 for a course of therapy and $520 a vial for private insurance companies. So different price structures. Hi, Jill. Jill Hetz is here. Jill, I hope Jill very often cuts my hair and I'm doing my best. I'm using a lot of gel just to keep it in place. So it's a little crazy looking. It's what it is. This is the time we're in. Anyway, uh, Gilead apparently sets, there's multiple prices when we want to have drugs. And this drug that's supposedly going to help us with uh, COVID if we get sick, uh, if this is for, through your private insurance company, it's going to go up to $3,200 for a course. And so you have to decide, how do they decide $3,200 versus 2340 uh, you know, uh, if the government wants to buy it. Reggie Helm's there. Reggie Helm from Owensboro. Glad you're here, Reggie. We ask everybody who shows up, please share this, uh, share this broadcast. Now we're looking to break the internet as soon as possible. We need your help to do that. Anyway, talking about the cost of remdesivir and what goes into it. And one way you can look at it is, what can we get for it? We've got this drug and it's going to save people's lives. How much can we get for it? And what's it worth to us? You know, what, what is the absolute best price we can get for it? That's one way of looking at it. Um, and you look at the price from clinical and cost benefits and so on and so on and so on. They're saying that this price that was set by Gilead falls comfortably within the range of cost effectiveness. Allison Hartow is here. Allison, I don't recognize your name. I'm very glad to see all these new faces. If you, anybody has a question or a comment, go for it. Allison, please share. That's what we harangue everybody. Please share this. Um, however, there's another side to it. And apparently, a huge portion of the development costs for remdesivir were paid for by guess who? Our government, meaning us. Um, they think they will have estimated, Gilead thinks they'll have invested one billion, but I think the United States invested more like, I'm looking for the number, I think I recall a number of something like six and a half billion dollars. And so there's, uh, they, and they own a patent and, and uh, you know, so they've got technical control over it, but uh, we've got a sizable taxpayer investment in this drug, and so they should in this time of a crisis, I think, do the right thing and charge a more reasonable price. So uh, that's the basic idea that we as Americans invested in a drug, did most of the investing, I think something like 80% was what I'd seen, and they are going for it on the pricing. They're not being completely awful, but they're being rather awful. So that's something we all wanna watch. You know, I keep talking about corruption. That is the kind of thing I'm talking about. We have more and more corruption. You would think that as the Trump administration starts to wind down and that as it looks like people are paying attention, you would think the corruption would wind down, but that's not what happens. What happens is they figure, well, the door is going to be shut soon, so they're going for it, and this is happening in multiple places. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about, let's see, did I find that? estimate of the price. Sorry about that. I wanted to be accurate, but I couldn't find the exact price just that second. Uh, on CNBC, we've learned that Brooks Brothers, 
Brooks Brothers. I'm wearing a Brooks Brothers shirt. Now, it's a very conservative company, but I got to tell you, I like this shirt, and I've got several of them, but they are apparently filing for bankruptcy, and they are the latest COVID, uh, what would you call that, uh, victim. So they're going bankrupt, and they're trying to sell uh, they're trying to sell their or get out of their rental agreements. Mark Tomorski is here from Las Vegas, Las Vegas. Mark, do us a favor and share. Uh, they've got, uh, they generated more than 991 million in sales last year. They've got more than 200 stores, uh, but they've had to close 51 of them. Uh, they've already closed them and it's not been enough. So uh, they're looking to redo things. Another headline from a website called Impact 2020. I wish I could show you all this stuff, but sometimes we just got to do it down and dirty. Sometimes it's just me and you, and that's all, that's all we can do. Anyway, headline says, Floyd protests teach scientists a lesson. COVID super spreads more indoors than out. So this means when you're outdoors, notice the lake behind me, when you're in the sun, you're in a lot better shape than if you're inside a house with other people or in an enclosed space and staying for a long time and not wearing a mask. So the sun is good, being outside is good, wind I'm guessing is good, the amount of time you spend close to other people is important. Um, uh, let's see if I can find this. Oh, a month after mass demonstrations, you know, I'm trying to do it all here. I've got to print up my stuff, I've got to have my pen ready to make marks, I've got to keep track of who's listening. So glad you're here. Uh, a month after we had mass demonstrations, one of the things that was claimed was, well, that's why our infection rate is going up. That's why we're having new cases. It's because people are protesting. Now, I went to a couple of protests. I went to one, and I'm going to another on Saturday, by the way. I'm going to be going to Bowling Green. There's a, uh, a silent walk in Bowling Green, I believe, at noon, and I can't remember which park it's at. So if uh, anybody can fill me in, like if John Alma, if you show up, John, uh, John Alma, please let us know which park that is. It's not right downtown. It's, uh, it's the other park that I forget the name of right this second. Anyway, I went to a couple of demonstrations and in one of them, everybody wore masks. It was very organized. This was in the city of Danville. Everybody was very respectful, even out in the hot sun. People were keeping their distance. And uh, we were talking to each other, but we were staying away and everybody was wearing masks. I also went to one in Litchfield, which is close to where I'm at. That's the county seat in Grayson County. And we had a, a small but fascinating uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protest. And I went to that one as well. But again, like I say, most folks were wearing masks. They were concerned about that. And that's what it turns to, it turns out that um, being outdoors, wearing masks, you're in less danger than you are if you're indoors at an event. Uh, someone named Johnny Few. Johnny, I think I've seen your name here before. Thanks for being here. Please do us a favor and share this, and let's bump our numbers up. Uh, what they're finding, surprisingly, is that cities that had huge, uh, huge uh, uh, amounts of protesters didn't see the rise that they were expecting to see. And of course, we did see a rise in uh, Omaha, or I take it back, in Tulsa, after the Trump rally. And uh, I've got a quote here. I found this on Naked Capitalism, but I believe it's from CBS. Tulsa health official says Trump rally likely contributed to a spike in coronavirus cases. And at Naked Capitalism, Rich Campbell's here. John Alma is here. John Alma, can you do me a favor, please, and post a link to the silent march if you got a moment? Um, so that anybody who's in the Bowling Green area could come and show up uh, to that. Uh, anyway, apparently we did see a rise in Tulsa, almost 500 new cases, which was out of the ordinary, and that was after President Trump's rally where he had, what, 6,000, 6,400 people show up in an uh, in indoor stadium that uh, wasn't the, even that crowded, but it was indoors. And so uh, Naked Capitalism, they speculate that there were five reasons that makes it, maybe makes it different. Uh, we mostly saw marchers being masked, and I certainly saw that. The rally attendees were not. Indoor stadium air is recirculated. Now, remember yesterday we talked about there's now a way, they think, 
that they can clear recirculated air of the virus, but it involves heating the air before you air condition it again up to 200 degrees. Can you imagine what that would take in a stadium to recycle air, heat it up to 200 degrees, now cool it back down again? That may be where we're going. Uh, stadiums have choke points where people tend to build up, and I think that's a very important part. When you're going into a, a rally, whether it's for President Trump or Biden or a football game or whatever, you invariably end up in a crowded area. And so that's, that's a place you'd want to watch out, especially if you're not wearing a mask. You're going to potentially get it. Marches tend to be out in the sun, we already said that, and the stadiums have artificial light. And in marches, number five, people are moving in a stadium, groups are stationary. So these are all ways for you, to all, you all to be aware to keep yourself safe, because we are not finished with this. We are not finished with this deal at all. I want to talk about something that really is only about Democrats. We're not, I'm going to stop for a moment complaining about uh, the entire country. I'm going to talk about what's going on, and this is a discussion between the uh, the two wings of the Democratic Party. One is the progressive wing, and I'm a proud member of the progressive wing. I call myself a progressive populist. By the way, when I post on conservative websites like the American Conservative, I get accused of being uh, pretending to be a conservative, which I, I've been told that before. I've been told one person said, "Yeah, well, you're a liberal conservative." A friend who was conservative. I'm not sure what that means. Anyway, there's been, there was a task force that was put together by Joe Biden that includes AOC and uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. And the idea was they were going to start to have some negotiations. Look, it's a behind the scenes kind of thing. They released their task force report today. And uh, the, the, what apparently the Biden team has agreed to is $15 minimum wage. Great. Repeal right to work laws. Double great especially in Kentucky, the right to work laws are, are kind of killing us. Dugan Ryan, I'm glad you're here. Dugan, do me a favor, please, and share this. Uh, Dugan is a family member of our neighbor, so uh, he's related. He's, he's kind of my neighbor. Glad you're here. Uh, the third piece that, they, that the task force approved is three-month paid family and medical leave. I think that's a good thing. I don't know if it's sufficient in the time of the coronavirus. You know, when we've got now 40 million people who are apparently out of work, and since most of us have, or many of us have, health care connected to the, our employment, when you have 40 million people lose their jobs, now you've got 40 million people who don't have health care. So uh, the things that they didn't get were Medicare for All. I'm in favor of Medicare for All. Derek Mobley is here. Derek, thanks for being here. Please do me a favor and share the broadcast. Um, now, Medicare for All, we can talk in depth about that, but the way I express it is I want health care that's less expensive, about 40% less expensive, more like what the rest of the wealthy, developed world pays. It needs to honestly cover all of us. We are covering everybody now, but we do it in a really inefficient and terrible way, inexpensive or, or inefficient is the, the big thing, corrupt way, actually. Uh, we need uh, it to be easier to use. You don't want to be, when your kid's in the hospital, you don't want to be on the phone with the insurance company arguing if you're going to get coverage. You don't want to have anything to do with that. So um, it needs to be easier to use. And finally, it needs to have better results. We need to be able to live longer, have lower rates of disease, to have lower rates of infant mortality. So better results is part of what we want. So that's why we go for Medicare for All. So. I believe at some point we're going to have to do some sort of single-payer system. I'm inclined to like a lot of what I see in the French system. For example, they have a policy they call solidarity, and it means the sicker you get, the less you pay. What a genius thing. They think our nation is barbaric because people lose their houses. They lose their life savings because someone in the family gets sick. And that's just, there's no good reason for that. We're the only uh, developed nation on earth that does that. Deborah Le Lenore is here. And Deborah, I don't know you. I don't recognize your name. So we're very glad to have you here. Do us a favor and share this. And if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and ask me and uh, I'll do my best. Uh, the final one they didn't get. Oh, there's two more. Sorry. 
The next one is the Green New Deal. Now the Green New Deal is kind of uh, controversial, or it can be, because there are lots of opinions about the Green New Deal, and when you read some of them, they sound extreme, and uh, fair enough. So if you've got any questions about the Green New Deal, it's probably best, and I learned this from my wife Pam, she went and read the actual proposal which is a 17-page document, and it's filled with whereas and wherefores. You're going to have to learn how to get through them. But it's not nearly so uh, scary as some people present the Green New Deal. Look, we all want to have a world where our kids and our grandkids can have a pleasant, wonderful place to live. I mean, look how beautiful this earth is. Look how beautiful it is here at Rough River. We want this to stay safe for humanity. Jeff Whitman's here. Jeff, I'm so glad you're here. Do us a favor, please, and share. We're talking about um, the arrangement between the task force, the Joe Biden task force that included uh, uh, AOC and uh, Senator uh, Bernie Sanders. John Alma is going to post the uh, info for the silent march on in Bowling Green and it's on Saturday at noon I believe I'm not sure which park though that's the big question John Alma so the Green New Deal if you'll look at the proposal it won't be quite so scary the last one is legalization of marijuana now I'm in favor of legalization of marijuana I'm, of course I don't want children to use it uh, of course we have to put restrictions on it and we're gonna have to do all kinds of things to protect farmers who decide to grow it but, excuse me, but, excuse me again, uh, Kentucky is one of five states that grows a billion, that's B, billion dollars worth of marijuana every year. We are the only one of the five states where marijuana is illegal or is not fully legalized. There are some, I think in some cases you can get legalized marijuana in Kentucky, but it's very restrictive. I think you have to go through the, the University of Kentucky there soon. So overall, look, this is a process and I'm very happy. Louise Kenworthy is here. Lu Louise, do me a favor and uh, share this. Louise is my neighbor here down at the lake and uh, very glad to have you here. And Louise, I tried to make it that we could see the lake. I don't know if, if we're, can we see some of the lake? I have to do better. I'll, I'll do a better job tomorrow, I promise. Uh, oh, five till seven at Circus Square. Okay. Oh, Sunday. I thought it was Saturday. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I'll get those details straightened out uh, downtown. Okay. Very good. Sorry to lead you all astray. Nothing worse. Uh, let's go on here. Let's see. What else have I got for you? Uh, let's see. Oh, now we've got some news about the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court's been dropping all kinds of interesting rulings right now. Uh, oh, was uh, Billy says that uh, cannabis was just legalized, was legalized in West Virginia. Well, that's going to put pressure on the state of Kentucky because uh, West Virginia is one of our neighbors. My wife is watching. So glad you're here. We are going to celebrate our 38th wedding anniversary on Saturday. It's July 11th. See if any of you can guess why that's the date we got married. Good luck. And Pam, no, don't let the cat out of the bag, cat out of the bag okay? Let's see if anybody can guess. Anyway, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that a large swath of Oklahoma is now an Indian reservation. It was a five to four decision, and what was kind of surprising about it is who voted. So the Supreme Court on Thursday ruled that much of eastern Oklahoma falls within an Indian reservation, a decision that could reshape the criminal justice system by preventing state authorities from prosecuting offenses that involve Native Americans. Um, five to four decision. Uh, the lands include much of Tulsa. Wow, it's now deemed Indian country by the high court. That's fascinating. Terry Thomas is here. Terry, I'm glad you're here. Please do us a favor and share. Everybody, please share. That's your job for today. It really helps. So we know we, as the United States, we've got a long history. Uh, we've got a long history of breaking treaties, making and breaking treaties 
with uh, Indian tribes and Oklahoma is right in the middle of all that. So this is a surprising, uh, surprising ruling. Chris Vitska is here. Chris is um, a dear friend who is a friend of our campaign and his, uh, his bar, the Odeon, is just a spectacular place. Odeon is open, I guess, from four in the afternoon now and they're serving drinks on the sidewalk. How nice is that? Once it cools down a little bit, a great place to go get an, a drink. Anyway, uh, I think it's fascinating that Justice Gorsh sided with the tribes. Rico Thomas is here from the uh, amazing Merry Pranksters, the band in Louisville that up until COVID had played something like a million Sundays in a row in Louisville, and I've played with them many times. They're a fantastic band. Rico, I'm glad you're here. Do us a favor, please, and share this. Uh, Facebook Live. Anyway, uh, Neil Gorsh, who's, you know, the stolen judge, the stolen seat, sided with the tribes, which is a little bit surprising, I guess. Uh, anyway, I think that's a fascinating story. Well, there's so much more to talk to you all. Um, oh, good. The website has it running at the same time. Yes, Terry, we do. I have even more to talk to you about, but I feel like I'm running out of time and I don't want to wear you out. Maybe we'll talk about this tomorrow. If you all are curious about it, I've been going on about corruption and the thing I'm going to talk about tomorrow is corruption in the uh, Justice Department. And the Justice Department, which is led by William Barr, uh, the Attorney General, and uh, there's more info now about the acting uh, uh, about uh, Justice Berman, uh, Jeffrey Berman, who was the Attorney General for, was he from New York? Uh, Southern District of New York. And he, uh, I guess he had a conference with uh, William Barr and then a few days later William Barr announced he's resigning. <laughs> He hadn't agreed to that. Anyway, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Meanwhile, I need what you what you all really need to do, please. Really take these social distancing guidelines seriously. You can be a little bit more relaxed when you're outside and if there's some breeze and if you're minimizing the time that you're around each other, but you really need to have a mask handy and look out for each other. This is not a disease you want to get. So I do want to say thank you. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing. We'll see you tomorrow. We're going to have some great guests coming up really soon. I spoke to some internationally famous musicians and songwriters. And uh, uh, and by the way, I say to them, hey, we can talk about music or we could talk about politics. And one really well-known musician said, oh, I want to talk about politics. So we'll have to save that surprise for later on. And uh, hopefully I can master the technology. I've been working on it really hard. All right. Love you all. Take care. I'll see you tomorrow, 4.30 Eastern, 3.30 Central. And uh, yes, we're getting angry, but that doesn't mean we're going to act like damn fools. That means we're going to store up our anger and use it to make for determination so that we can do the right thing, so that we can change our nation come this November. All right. Thank you all. Take care.